Welcome to Shovelware Diggers. Our dig team's currently excavating the Soft Key Shareware 2000 Hit Games 2CD Collection. You can find a link in the video description containing the entire directory structure of this archive. Here's what our diggers have for week 199. For more information on how to join the dig team, simply follow the Patreon link in the video description. Now without further ado, let's get started. First up, we have a team dig from Anonymous Freak and Christopher Groff. DOS games backslash cards backslash EVGABJ. I'm going to guess an EGA slash VGA version of Blackjack. Because, well, we're in the cards folder, so BJ kind of generally stands for Blackjack under those circumstances. Um, an executable, text file, comments, bunch of batch files, a readme that's surprisingly large. Um, okay, so, first of all, let's load up that, that took a while to load. Like, I mean, I know I have the cycles countdown, but, Blackjack, your win key, <laughs> split across the screen, your key to winning casino play, and apparently this was made by a Donald Granger, and there is a lot to this document from the looks of it. Blackjack is not public domain software. <laughs> Copyrighted, um, Glencoe Computing. It's interesting how it went through a whole bunch of details about how you need to register your software and everything, and yet it didn't actually say how much the registration fee was. So I guess we'll get to that at some point. But there is a lot to this document here. It seems to be a lot of... um. Because, I mean, I looked at the file dates. This was pre-90s, so there's going to be a lot of stuff here just to, what do you say, just to get people to understand how to actually get it running and how to play it from a technical standpoint, just because of the fact that it might not be perfectly straightforward. And then we actually do have a whole bunch of basic blackjack rules here. So, well, that's interesting. It seems like it can represent different casinos and the kind of rules that they typically have at black with their blackjack tables. I don't think I've ever seen a card program do that before. Like simulating the rules that are found at particular casinos. Although it's going to be like 30 years out of date, but still. This program even goes the extra mile to teach you how to count cards. <laughs> Mental note, don't ever let them catch you doing that in Vegas. <laughs> Okay, so this is apparently $30 software for a, quote, enhanced version, which I don't know what the difference is going to be. But apparently you can also spend $100 and get the full source code. So that's kind of interesting that a program, if this is as powerful a program as this document is leading us to believe then that would be interesting, actually having source code available. But that also means this is a $30 blackjack program, so <laughs> it better actually be really freaking good. But anyways, let's get out of here. Let's see what we got. So we got a bunch of batch files. I'm just going to say BJ. And welcome to blackjack, your key to winning play. I do like that it has its own custom cards and everything there. Oh, but there's the registration fee. I guess it would have been easier to find if we just started the program. <laughs> so you have a choice of casino here. Glencoe's Golden Palace, Valley's Park Place Casino, Peppermill Hotel Casino, or Caesar's, Caesar's Palace Casino. Um, I don't want to go to Caesar's Palace. Okay, so insurance pays 2 to 1, Blackjack plays three to, pays 3 to 2. Let's do normal, one player... Number of auto players. Uh, I don't need any auto players. Minimum bet, five, I guess. Table limit is 500. Player stake, 250. Status display, yes. Um, yeah, there we go. So, play. Press the key to cut the deck. I, I didn't want to cut it that way. <laughs> uh, so, if. When it comes to deck cutting mechanics, you really should allow the player some control over that. Like, I mean, I know it's just doing it for look, but still. And actually, why don't we just bet, why don't we bet ten? So we got seventeen. They've got a ten showing. 
Uh, yeah, that's a stand. Darn. <laughs> Uh, we got 10, and they've got a 9 showing. That would be a hit. We got 20. We're standing. And we have blackjack. Yeah. Okay, I notice how at the side of the screen, it's actually showing how much of the deck we've burned through. And I'm going to guess that that red tick at the top of the meter there is actually the point when it will reshuffle. So it's not actually going through the entire deck. Um, we got 20. Oh, split? Are you crazy? <laughs> you don't split 10s. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, we lost because he managed to get an 8 there, but statistically, we statistically we had a pretty good chance of winning that. <laughs> now we're up to 14. Um, hmm. Well, why don't we check out some of these other things that are going on? Because I haven't really been paying attention to the side of the screen here. So it's t telling us, like, the actual counts and everything says we played 49 cards, running count 4, ace count 1, current hand 9. Not quite sure what that is. Um, it says there's two decks in use. Um, now what are these values thing? Oh, that just turns... Um, I can't get it back on. <laughs> That's weird. Um, what about deck graph? Oh, there you go. Yeah, for some reason the values won't show up again. Um, I'm just going to... S yeah, I'm just going to stand. And yeah, it did win for me. Seven, we're going to hit. Fourteen, he's showing a nine. Yeah, I got a hit. Seventeen. Uh, stand. Nah. I didn't think I was going to... Didn't think it was going to survive that one. Thirteen, and he's got an eight. Darn it. <laughs> Hits? No. Blackjack, even... Oh, he might have Blackjack as well. But even if he does, it would be a tie, so... I don't need insurance. <laughs> How often does that happen? Both the dealer and the player get a Blackjack. <laughs> 16, he's showing a 5. That is a stand. Aw, he had an ace back there. That is the sound of shuffling cards. <laughs> At least, as, as performed by the PC speaker. <laughs> so yeah, on the surface, this seems to be a fairly basic blackjack game. But it seems like there is a lot more going on behind the scenes. And a lot more options to take advantage of for making it work better. So, yeah, I think all things considered, this is actually a fairly decent blackjack program. The question is, is it worth $30? And I guess as far as if it's worth $30 or not is concerned, I think that really, you have to consider when this came out. This had fi this had um, file dates of 89 on it, right? So that would actually make it pretty old, and yet it has like high-res EGA graphics here, and you know, this is actually pretty decent for when it came out, so yeah. I'd say if I'd say if blackjack was your thing, then yeah, this would be this would actually be a thirty dollar blackjack game in the late eighties that would actually be worth the value. Next up from Felicia Gladson, we've got DOS Games backslash arcade three backslash warp space. Well, probably something called warp space, I'm guessing. Um it's got the EGA VGA BGI, so we know it's written with Borland stuff. Um Doc file, text files, a guts.doc, <laughs> and an ega.doc. Hmm, I just noticed something here. There's an e1 host file and an e1 user file. So this might be like a BBS software type of thing. Maybe. Well, let's actually like load up one of these documents here. Um, Okay, this has me slightly worried here. Warp Space is played on two computers using modems. Happens in real time, has an arcade game feel to it. Um, a little worried that maybe this isn't going to play single player. I'm going to keep reading into the document a bit here to see if I can find any info on that. 
Okay, I found a part right here that says to practice the game, just run E1 user. So that means that we don't have to actually have a two player game going. We can just run the user program and we should still be able to play it. Now it won't play as the full proper game since it needs a second player, but at least we'll get an idea of how this was normally supposed to play. Anyway, so Warp Space is about spaceships. Actually, there are eight different ships to choose from. When you start, you must decide what you will be. Your ship has phasers, photon torpedoes, shields, and warp drive. You can customize your ship by selecting how fast it will fly and how hard your weapons fire. Fast ships use up more fuel, but they can maneuver better. Torpedoes come in various sizes. You have one monster torp, or 20 small torps, or anything in between. Okay, another important thing there. Turn off numlock. Good to know. And apparently we've also got scanners too. Not entirely certain what that would be used for, but... And apparently you can also do interstellar jumps. Cloaking, orbiting planets. If this is supposed to be a game where two people are simply attacking each other, why do we have... Why do we have the ability to beam armies aboard our ship? There seems to be a lot of stuff going on here. And apparently the guy who made this was accepting orders through El Paso, Texas. But what is the actual registration fee? $30. Okay, so we've already seen a blackjack game from the late 80s that was worth $30 for anybody who was really into blackjack. But now we've got a piece of $30 software here which requires you <laughs> to have two computers to play the game. <laughs> And then on top of that, theoretically, you would actually need to buy two copies. <laughs> unless there's like some... unless you don't have to. Um, did it actually say anything about that? Because that's one of the interesting things about licensing, is that normally when you buy a copy of a program, you're buying a license to use it on one computer at a time. <laughs> but I do, I do remember... Um, Actually, does anybody else remember this? Back when they re back when they made Diablo, they actually made it so that you could have Diablo install a multiplayer only copy onto someone's computer. So the person who owned the game could actually give out these special copies to their friends so that they could play it together, although the person who owned the actual copy would be the only one allowed to actually play the game single player or the host or to host the sessions or whatever. So, it could be something like that, where, yeah, it says here, give your opponent a copy of the game disc. Well, that just says give a, your opponent a copy of the game disc. It's not saying you have to, like, what if you wanted to, what if you suddenly have, like, ten people using the same disc? Like, <laughs> that seems a little weird. Okay, let's actually play this thing. So E1 user is the one we want to run just so to practice playing it. So user player system. And I got copyright statement. Must select a team to join. We can be Terran, Orion, Alpha, and Delta, Omegan, Thaden, Centurion, or Saurian. Which I'm pretty sure almost all of those were referenced in Star Trek at some point. <laughs> um why don't we be Orion? Because why not? Must specify the maximum velocity your ship is capable of attaining. Hmm. Let's go six. Specify the maximum number of torpedoes, which you may have in flight at one time. Larger the number, the smaller, weaker, and faster your torpedoes will be. Let's make it ten. Specify the phaser recharge time between 1 millisecond and 30 milliseconds. Okay. <laughs> okay, screen's a little flickery. Um, maybe I can adjust the cycles count to deal with that. Yeah, the game's not super responsive. Maybe I should have had it at a higher speed. Yeah, I don't like that the game is kind of flickering. Although I'm guessing that this is what the different sen scanner ranges are for because, yeah, we can actually zoom in. There's a little bit of a delay between pushing a key and something actually happening. So let's just get an idea of how this works here. So if we want to like fire our phasers... Okay. Burned through a lot of fuel though, how the heck did that happen? <laughs> um, what about torpedoes? 
There goes a torpedo. So yeah, this is more kind of like a slow-paced battle. This actually kind of feels sort of like what they tried with the battle system in Star Trek the Next Generation on the SNES and Genesis. The battle system in that those in those particular Star Trek games is actually not that bad. It can be a little frantic, but if you know what you're doing, it actually works out fairly well. Uh, I got a funny feeling I'm about to run out of fuel. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I can't turn anymore. What? Why can't I turn? In fact, I can't even affect my velocity. Yeah, something I hit must have done something because I can't actually... I can't control anything now. Well, I'm almost out of fuel, so... Goodbye, universe. It was nice knowing you. And... Fuel is... What? <laughs> what? <laughs> um. Okay. So apparently negative fuel is a thing. <laughs> Maybe. That's weird. So like it it should be like negative forty five and going up negative values. Oh boy, it doesn't look like that was programmed properly. So yeah, that was warp space. Um, I can't really demonstrate it that well so but the, I guess the bigger question is is it worth $30 and no even if this was working properly the fact that it doesn't it doesn't seem like it seems like there's supposed to be more to this than it, there needs to be like it's been overcomplicated when it's just supposed to be two players shooting at each other so yeah to that end I don't think it would have been worth a $30 price tag but given the fact that we're talking the early days of modem gameplay, any kind of real-time game playing over a modem would have been rare at that point. So it is kind of breaking some new ground in that respect. I just don't think it would make it worth thirty dollars. Like maybe twenty. Like if you had a if you had a friend, you guys were like really into this or something. But no, not thirty. Uh, it really sucks that this one failed. So from the Great Code Holio, we have DOS Games backslash arcade backslash 3D COHS, and I actually know what this is. Funny thing is though, is that this is one of those games on the CD that you can't actually run from the CD because that 3D COHS file there is actually a self extractor. Which, since I have this on my hard drive and not on the CD, this should extract perfectly fine. Like, I mean, there's a start.com file, so maybe that's what I gotta run. No, that didn't do anything. Yeah, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get out of this program here. Like, I mean, this is just the, about the program thing. Like, maybe it says how to start the program in here? Yeah, apparently all you're supposed to do is type start and it's supposed to go, but... As you can see, it's not working. Oh uh, boy. Um, yeah, I'm out of ideas here. <laughs> I really hate the fact that this is about to be a failed dig because this is something that I would have absolutely looked forward <laughs> to showing everybody. I, I'm definitely gonna have to try to figure out why this isn't working because yeah, all you're supposed to do is type start and it's supposed to start up. That's what it said in the documentation. Obviously, it's not working, and I have no idea why not. Because it's not like I've never run programs that use this particular engine before. <laughs> yes, I actually know what engine this uses. So, uh, yeah. At some point, I'll try to figure out why this isn't working. Because definitely something I want to show you guys. But for now, it's unfortunately a failed dig. Unfortunately, that was also the Great Code Holio's last dig. So we're going to be finishing off with a dig from Troy Bowman. DOS Games backslash adventure backslash Dunjax1. I'm going to guess some kind of dungeon crawl program. Um, well, I just got a whole bunch of Dunjax files. I do have a doc file and a snail.exe. And then also, that's interesting. 
the dunjax.a file there is exactly 50,000 bytes. So that kind of suggests to me that it's some kind of uncompressed data of some sort. And I just noticed that's actually a really small executable size. Huh. Okay. Well, let's see what the doc file has to say here. Dunjax.doc. So apparently this Dunjax program was made by uh, Jeff Mather and David Nyack? Or Nice? Nyack or Nice, one of those two. Maybe. <laughs> um, 128k of random access memory. <laughs> you don't often see people spell that out. Oh, this is only a DOS 2.0 program? And yet it was made in 1990? What? Okay, um, that's unusual. Like, the minimum DOS spec that a computer would typically have by 1990 would be 3.2. So, DOS 2. Okay, let's, let's try to get past that. Because that's just weird. But, anyways, Dunjax is a side view action adventure game challenging you to shoot and jump, levitate your way through massive underground labyrinths filled with hazardous traps and relentless creatures. Full screen tile graphics are used to simulate the dungeons. Are... And this apparently works with 128K of RAM. Oh, we actually have a story to this one. Okay, so, as an intrepid astral explorer, you have discovered many uncharted solar systems and their respective planets. On your latest starship propelled expedition, you have found a previously unknown planetoid with a livable atmosphere, a rarity of outstanding proportions. However, in attempting to touch down on its surface, mechanical problems have caused you to crash land on a muddy mountain basin, your ship nearly meeting destruction. Coming to from a prolonged period of unconsciousness, you have found that creatures of the strange native wildlife have bored into your craft's hull and have either eaten or stolen an essential propulsion device necessary for you to lift off, once repairs on the ships have been made. Following the large web tracks which lead from the hull, you have found and entered the large cave that cuts into the bottom of a sheer cliff face. This cliff towers over the basin in which you have crashed. Having donned your needler rifle and propulsive boots, you hope to be prepared for whatever you will face in the search ahead. If it still exists, the missing engine part must be found for you to get off the planet and return to your explorations. <laughs> uh, I tried to do that dramatically. Don't know if that worked out well. <laughs> And apparently the registration fee for this is $10, so... <laughs> the first registered user of Dunjax to send us a photograph of the game screen where the Starship part is located will receive a free copy of all five of the other games that we offer for sale. I wonder how many people... I wonder if anybody actually t managed to take advantage of that. Okay, so I have no idea how this is going to fit in a 5,000 kilo... 5,000 byte executable, but here we go. Well, we got CGA graphics. Um, okay. So, whoa. It's moving way too fast. Ah, it's moving way too fast. Okay, turning the cycles way the heck down. <laughs> okay, so left, right to move left, right. Up arrow is to jump, levitate. Space bar is to change your facing. R is to fire the needler. Okay, not the... Not the most usual controls, but... Okay, I think we're doing a little better now. Whoa! Okay, so it's a little weird that it's actually got like, um... It's actually got like a, a whole viewing system going on. And how did that enemy go into the ground? That was weird. Got the enemy to get over that thing. No idea what it's for, but I'm gonna guess that touching is probably a bad idea. Oh, now it's following me. Let's just move, let's just move. Lots of enemies, let's move. Okay, we're through the door. <laughs> that was kind of kind of intense for the kind of controls going. Now I understand why the player has such a huge life bar at the bottom. Ooh, sliding down there. 
Okay, and we have unlimited ammo, so... Okay, now I understand why there's a there's a button to change which direction you're facing. Because it does kind of become necessary. Oh, we can stand on these things without taking a hit. And apparently jumping into spike. Never mind, jumping into spikes does hurt. <laughs> I thought for a second that jumping into spikes wasn't hurting because I kept falling right as my head was hitting spikes, but no, if you jump into spikes, it will hurt. And wow, the game is going really fast still. I literally have the cycles turned like all the way down. If I turned it any lower, the game would like stop. Yeah, it's actually pretty impressive that the game is running this fast, given what I've got the cycles set to. Okay, so I'm starting to understand how this fit into 5 kilobytes now. <laughs> so I'm going to guess that the A file was probably the map for this game. Oh, we found a key. Just have to find a way to get it without getting killed there. The game suddenly slowed down again. Not entirely certain why certain areas are going faster than others. I'm going to guess it has something to do with the way he's processing the map. That would be my best guess as to why certain areas seem to be f seem to process so much faster than other areas. Okay, that would be another reason why you can change direction because if you end up trapped, then you need to be able to switch directions to face your opponent properly. Well, that's interesting. If you actually hit a spike, it destroys the spike. Huh. I'm not sure how the controls are supposed to work here, but I got the funny feeling that maybe these controls are supposed to be better than this. Because I can't hold keys. It's using, the, it's using standard BIOS keyboard handling, so holding keys is a no-go. So... I don't know. Not so much amateur quality to it. Because it, 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 well, it is technically an amateur quality, but it's like more intermediate. Like the person's, the person's graduated from just doing text-based games and is now doing their own graphics and stuff. I don't know how I'm supposed to make that jump. There we go. Got the key. So, I can only, I can only take a few more hits before I die, so... Probably not going to go well. Okay, so act, for all things considered, this is not bad for what it is. For a $10 game, for a $10 game coming out, well, actually, that's a very poor, important point, is that this came out in 1990. So, is it still, if this was came out in the 80s, then yeah, definitely worth $10, but it came out in the 90s, so now it's not so clear cut if it would be worth $10 or not. You know what? I think if the guy if the guy had plans to update this, which apparently he did, because he was going to make a Dunjax two, right? So I don't know. It's definitely interesting. It's just it's hard to it's hard to really it's hard to really grasp if this would have been worth a ten dollar price tag in nineteen ninety. That's the only trick.